Toronto. Oh, yeah. Okay. Is the balloon is going forward. Okay, so it has a funny color, but it works. <laughs> okay, it's not really funny. And it can be seen from uh, Zoom as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you have the floor, please. All right. Let me just. All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizer for letting me do this talk instead of uh, Max O'Fines, who was originally invited but couldn't make it, unfortunately, and uh, with whom I work at the University of Sherbrooke at the uh, Institut Quantique. So I'm going to talk about uh, voltage bias Josephson junction again, and I'm going to focus on the results we had uh, on two different devices using uh, this. So mainly it would be an amplifier and a photo multiplier that can be used as a photo detector, uh, both based on this inelastic copper pair tunneling. So first I'd like to uh, acknowledge the people who really did this work because I just started my postdoc with Max, so um, most of the work has been done by the, his PhD students in Grenoble and uh, more recently in Sherbrooke by Joel Grismar and Ulrich Martel, who is a master's student. We also had a nice collaboration with uh, Joao Pagangas for the description of the photomultiplication. So I first describe quite quickly the, the concept. We already talked about it quite a lot this week. And uh, basically we're using Josephson junctions and we all know Josephson junctions. Uh, usually if you want to make a current uh, devices such as a qubit that is basically just an harmonic system, you will use the Josephson junction in a zero voltage state where you can uh, take uh, advantage of this uh, parallelic potential to realize your two-level system. But if you increase the current inside the system, and even when you uh, go above the critical current of the Jordan junction, you will be in a, in a place where uh, a voltage will start to develop at, a, at a, um, around the Jordan junction. Then you will uh, start to lose your current for your system in something you don't really want in uh, devices such as qubits. I really like this picture to describe this phenomena. If you think about the Jolson junction as a sailing ship that is residing on this uh, flat uh, earth uh, picture, well, you can think about the horizontal axis as the current, and when the, the phase particle, that is the junction, goes above the critical current, it falls inside this uh, monster of instant current. So when the, the junction is uh, in its voltage state, uh, we don't have this uh, interesting current uh, behavior, but we have other interesting things. So with all, as we already uh, discussed, and especially uh, on Wednesday morning, if we look at the IV characteristic of a single Josephson junction biased in uh, voltage, uh, well, we do not see uh, anything in this voltage state, but there is still the presence of uh, an AC excitation is mainly the AC Jolson effect. And if we add uh, an environment in this system, then we start to have interesting uh, phenomenon happening. Basically, when the, uh, voltage, uh, the voltage bias will be chosen so that the Jolson energy, uh, the Jolson frequency, sorry, back, uh, is chosen so that the real part of the impedance of the environment is non zero then we'll have inelastic Cooper pair tunneling through the junction and we'll have uh, the apparition of a DC current inside the system that we can measure. Basically, the power is uh, going through from the Josephson junction to the environment. You can think about that as dissipation. Another way to see that, and it was already described uh, on Wednesday again, um, would be to think about it as a Cooper pair that has uh, additional energy because of this voltage bias and cannot tunnel through the junction because there is no state in front of that. And when you add an environment, you add a channel for this energy to be dissipated, and then the uh, Cooper pair can tunnel through the Jolson junction by emitting a photon at this uh, particular frequency. The signature of this phenomena, those bumps in the IV characteristics, uh, as it has been measured in uh, 1994, and uh, more recently, in an experiment by uh, Max O'Fines uh, with uh, Fabien Portier in Saclay, an experiment that was already mentioned by uh, Denis Villon in, uh, on Wednesday morning, where they did the same, the same setup. So basically, it's a Josephson junction coupled to a Coplana waveguide resonator that acts as a single mode or multi mode, more likely, uh, environment. 
at uh, with a resonating mode at six gigahertz, they will they will have been able to measure the current quite precisely, going through the DC current, going through the junction, and the number of photons that were coming out of the system. What they measured is here on the right is the rates in red, the rates the rates of Cooper pair tunneling through the junction, and in blue the rates of uh, photons being emitted, and they showed that these rates were a non-zero, whereas the impedance of the environment was non-zero, as expected. The interesting thing here is that the rate of uh, Cooper pair and the rate of photons are exactly equal. That means a Cooper pair of energy 2EV will uh, produce one photon inside the environment. Another thing they saw, and uh, it was a bit more interesting, was uh, at the voltage bias that it was twice this, uh, the value for this uh, original peak. And they also saw photons being emitted at six gigahertz with this voltage bias. That means the Cooper pair gives rise to two photons inside the environment. So more generally speaking, if we have a Josephson junction and we consider a general environment, for example, in the form of the Calder and negative decomposition for a resonator, uh, we can create a, a Cooper pair tunneling through the junction will create uh, an ensemble of uh, photons and the rates of uh, tunneling for the Cooper pair will be, uh, it will depend on the Josephson energy, but also on this delta function, and uh, the Cooper pair can tunnel only if the sum of the energy in the system is zero. Means that the energy to EV has to be divided inside uh, several photons inside the different modes of the environment. Um, if we look at just two modes inside the environment, uh, we can go a bit further inside to, in this description and look at how these photons will be created. And we end up with uh, those um, amplitude here, the mn of k that are uh, described here. And that depends on those coefficients, alpha k, that is basically just the reduced impedance of the mode. So the impedance of the mode divided by the supercondition in quantum of uh, resistance describes just the coupling of the mode with the junction. So we see that in an experimental, uh, for an experimental system, this is quite interesting because uh, we have two different variables that control this process. One is the value of the impedance of the environment, and this we can control. We can make the environment as we want. And the other one is the voltage that we apply to the junction. And again, this variable can be controlled quite precisely. And this makes this full uh, uh, platform really interesting uh, for experimental devices. So using this platform, uh, we talked uh, on Wednesday, Denis talked about uh, using this to create sources, uh, to create photons, and a high number of photons. Uh, you can also use these systems if you add uh, inside your environment, alongside your uh, single resonating mode, you can add a capacitive term in the form here of a LC circuit. You will then prevent subsequent tunneling of Cooper pairs because of this charging energy, and then you will end up with a single photon uh, generating device. It's something that was uh, measured by Max in the group of, uh, with, with Max a few years ago. In the opposite scenario, if you have two uh, modes inside your environment, you can show that uh, if you bias your Josephson junction so that the energy is equal to one photon in each of the modes, you will have um, pairs of photons that have non-classical properties. And that was again uh, shown in the work of uh, Fabian and uh, Ambroise Pozo, his PhD student in Saclay. In our group, we are more interested in the measurement side of things, kind of. So basically, we're making two devices at the moment. One is an amplifier, and the other one is a photomultiplier. I will start by describing the result we have on the amplifier, and then we go to the photomultiplier, and hopefully I'll have enough time to describe both of them. So in the case of the amplifier, we have, again, two different resonating modes inside our environment, and we bias our Josephson junction so that we create, uh, we can spontaneously create a photon inside one of each mode. But this time we also send uh, an incoming signal that we want to amplify uh, 
And basically, this is going to trigger uh, simulated emission inside the system. And uh, we can consider this device as a parametric amplifier, and that means that theoretically we can achieve constant limited amplification. So our uh, measurement setup is uh, represented here, and the device is over there with the Josephson junction as a form of a squid, so we can control the Josephson energy, and a coplanar waveguide resonator that is around six gigahertz. So that is the same device as I talked uh, a bit in the beginning of the talk. And we can measure this device um, using homodai detection through a VNA, uh, using a VNA, or we can measure the noise emitted by the, the system using power spectral density measurements. At the same time, we apply a voltage bias to achieve these processes. So what I, um, I'm showing here is one of those measurements. So here we have this device and we apply no input signal. So we're just looking at the spontaneous emission of the device as a function of the, uh, the voltage bias we apply. So we're measuring the power spectral density between four and eight gigahertz and uh, we increase the voltage bias. Well, we can see here, uh, we can see differently, basically. Uh, we see these lines, this line at the bottom, uh, that is basically the Josephson frequency of the, of the junction. It means we are emitting photons inside the environment. And when this line crosses the, uh, res the resonant frequency of the environment, around six gigahertz, we see interesting things start happening. So basically, here, when the, the bias equals exactly the, uh, the resonance frequency, we have the emission of one photon each time a Cooper pair tunnels through the junction. But uh, if we increase this bias by a factor of two, we see we can achieve uh, the generation of two photons inside this mode. And if we increase it even higher, so this time at four times the original uh, value for the bias, we have uh, other things happening. And we start to excite one photon inside the, the fundamental mode of the coplanar waveguide resonator and one photon in the, the third mode, the third harmonic uh, of the environment. And we can go even higher to the fifth harmonic and, and so on. But we, we stopped at 35 gigahertz for uh, experimental practical reasons. If we take the same device and we now uh, send an incoming signal that we want to amplify, we can measure the gain of the device. And this is what we see here in this uh, color plot. We've in red uh, the, the, the gain that is positive and in blue the gain negative, so losses. And uh, we have uh, the same kind of lines for the gains, so the same processes as described just before, the one photon process, the two photon process, and uh, the two photons in two different modes process. And those processes are uh, associated with gain. So we, uh, we have an amplifier that provides gain at those, point, at those points. The gain can go up to 10 dB for this particular device. But what we also see in this uh, graph is those blue lines. We count the, those as losses, but it's not really losses per se, it's just uh, frequency conversion, means that at, at those points, the, uh, the incoming photon energy uh, couples to the, Joseph, the Cooper pair energy to create a photon in one of the or higher order uh, harmonic mode. If we look a bit more closely on the um, those curves, we take some uh, cuts inside these 2D plots. We can have those uh, more classical curves where we see uh, on the left uh, the, uh, the gain of the device as a function of frequency, and on the right, this is the noise of the device as a function of frequency. So first thing on the left, we uh, can now measure the, the bandwidth of this amplification process. It's uh, of the order of 100 megahertz for this device. But what is more interesting is those dashed line that we plotted here were uh, calculated using a POV uh, calculation for, the, uh, for this device. And we see while we do not have a quantitative agreement, the qualitative picture is uh, quite close. They're quite close together. Of course, we know uh, in those devices, the Josephson energy is higher, is quite high. And we know we cannot really apply the POV theory, so that's why they are not uh, close together. 
On the right here, we have the added noise. Those are the noise added by the device are referred as uh, the input of the device. And we see that for the case of the blue line, so the, this uh, particular cut here, we have a noise that is sitting at twice the value for these dashed lines. Dashed line here represents the, the quantum limit for, this, uh, for the device, so the quantum limit of noise, or alpha photon added at the input. And we see that for this device, it, at this working point, we achieve something around two times the quantum limit, which, is, uh, which was pretty nice to see at the time. Uh, and that was using the first, one of the first devices Max ever made in Grenoble. Of course, uh, it tried to improve that uh, in the, the past few years, and uh, quite recently, uh, we measured a new device that had uh, quite more interesting performances. And this device is uh, summarized here in uh, all those points. So each of these points correspond to one working point, so a set of uh, voltage bias and frequency for a single device. So we can, for a single device, we can choose where to work, which voltage to use, which frequency to use, which process to, uh, to target, and this uh, results in uh, different um, performances for the amplification. So the gain will be different, the bandwidth will be different, and the noise will be different. So this is all summarized on those two plots. So on the left, you have the bandwidth of the amplification as a function of the gain. And on the right, uh, we have the added noise divided by the quantum limit as a function of the gain. So the first thing we can see is on the left here, the maximum gain we can achieve is now around 25 dB, which is more than twice uh, the, the amount we had on the previous device. And is uh, more in line with what other uh, amplification devices pro uh, propose. But uh, for those high uh, gain, we see that the bandwidth is limited, around one megahertz, and we feel limit ourselves to the 20 dB gain uh, which is more the reference to compare amplifiers, we have a bandwidth that is around 10 or 20 megahertz. If we look on the right now, uh, if, and at the, the noise, and again around the 20 dB uh, mark, we see that we have two working points that are really close to the quantum limit, and in fact they're below 1.5 times the quantum limit. So for these uh, new devices, we improve both the gain and the noise uh, of, the, of the amplifier, and we start to have really, really uh, nice uh, performances, really nice characteristics. Of course, I have to compare our device with other devices, and uh, our device being DC-powered, uh, I need to compare the, uh, this device with other DC-powered amplifier. First one being the Ampt, of course, is widely used. And the other two are two different propositions uh, to use Josephson junction to realize DC power amplifier. The first one is a superconducting low undulating galvanometer, and the second one is a single junction amplifier. If we compare all those to the Josephson parametric amplifier, of course we have to compare ourselves to the Josephson parametric amplifier, uh, we can see that there is a main difference that is the power source. Our devices are using a DC bias. That is the, their main advantages uh, because it's easier to, uh, to control and to implement a DC bias. There is less uh, components involved, uh, while the Jefferson parametric amplifier use an RF pump. If we look at the noise, though, uh, we see that, of course, the Jefferson parametric amplifier is still the best, that we, uh, we still have not beaten that, uh, that result. But we see our noise is now really close to the Joyson parametric amplifier. And our, uh, the noise level of our devices is well lower than what other DC power amplifier pro are uh, putting forward. And we think this is true, this is the case because in our device we have a dedicated electromagnetic mode for the, for the idler in this parametric amplification process. So that will be all for the amplifier, so as a Quick uh, summar uh, summary: We have a device that is has noise below the quantum limit, uh, below two times the quantum limit, 
uh, with a around 20 dB of gain. Uh, I didn't really talk about it, but the saturation power is around minus 125 dBm, uh, close to what uh, Joseph's on parametric amplifier would have, and our bandwidth is between 10 and 100 megahertz. The main advantage, as I said, of those devices is that we don't need a uh, microwave radio frequency pump of high power, but uh, the one of the drawback is that we don't have a phase reference inside this voltage bias. So that means the, uh, the phase sensitive regime will, be, will not be accessible in those kind of device, at least as we, uh, we, we make them. So I will now talk about the other device we're making in Sherbrooke, and that is a photomultiplier. Basically, it's, uh, it's, it can be the exact same uh, chip as the amplifier, but used slightly differently. So now we are, we are still using two uh, different modes in the, in the environment, but we bias the junction so that the energy to EV plus an incoming photon will be uh, equal to the energy of several output photons in the output mode, in the blue mode here. This is basically frequency conversion. And uh, if we choose the, the parameters correctly, uh, we, theoretically we should not have any spontaneous emission but you see we do have some still, because uh, the value to EV here is not equal to any of the modes in itself. It needs the complementary energy from an incident photon to create several photons inside the, uh, the output mode. Uh, using the work of uh, for the early uh, we could uh, characterize or calculate the uh, Josephson energy that would be needed to have um, a, um, a perfect conversion in, in those process. Basically, using input-output uh, description for the system, you can uh, show that for any uh, characteristics, of, so for example, for any uh, frequency, any bandwidth of the, the resonators, and for any value of n, where n is a multiplication factor, you can find a Josephson energy that would provide the system with a perfect a conversion efficiency, meaning every photon that we come in the system would be converted. This uh, value, they again depend on those uh, coefficient alpha, so the reduced impedance of the of the modes, and uh, to have a low enough Josephson energy, so we can manufacture the device. We would like to have this low alpha to be to be higher, to be close to one, basically. So the mm, the device I will show you, show you the result on is, uh, is the same actually as the last amplifier device and is basically, uh, again, two resonating mode, two LC resonating mode, one at five gigahertz and one at six gigahertz. Uh, because of manufacturing reasons, uh, the impedance of those modes was limited to below 500 ohm. So the alpha uh, coefficient is around 0.2 in, the, in this device. Uh, so we, um, sorry, yeah. uh, we measure those devices by sending us um, a really weak incoming uh, coherent signal and measuring what is uh, going out of the device at the frequency of the output mode. By doing so, we can calculate the, the probability, uh, the different probability of the system. So the, either the probability of the photon being reflected at the entrance of the device or the probability of the, um, of the phone being converted. So here, reflected is in blue, and converted is in orange. And we also have uh, spurious processes that we don't really want to have, but we still have because of experimental realization. And this is the direct transmission of the incoming photon through the capacitance of the junction without being converted. Here it's in green. And the, the last pro spurious process we have here is the photon is converted, then reflected inside the device. So the frequency changes, but it goes out from the, the wrong way, from the input of the device. So we see that here are those probabilities as a function of the flux, so as a function of the Josephson energy. Uh, we see we have a, a certain value for the Josephson energy that enable us to have a, a perfect, uh, not a perfect conversion, but to have a zero reflection inside the device. At the same time, we have 
uh, conversion efficiency that reaches nearly 75%. Uh, and uh, the other previous processes are still quite, uh, have a quite low probability. But at the same time, we see that the total probability here in uh, black is not equal to one, it's below one, means we have losses inside our system somewhere we don't, uh, we don't know yet, we don't understand really well. Or at least we didn't measure at that time. Uh, the last information we have on this graph is this gray curve here. And this gray curve is uh, the dark rate. So the uh, emission of photons by the system when no input photon is sent uh, to it. That's uh, a limiting factor in here for this uh, particular working point. Well, a dark rate of around 10 megahertz. Uh, theoretically, we should have no dark rate, but we still have some because that's an experimental realization. And if we look at the same results, but this time as a function of the input frequency, we have the same kind of curves and we can measure the uh, input bandwidth of the device that is around 100 megahertz again. So the input bandwidth is mainly fixed by the, the width of the input resonator and uh, here it was around 100 megahertz. The maximum efficiency uh, was uh, 73%. So this is uh, oh, I forgot to mention it was for the one to two photon conversion. And we can now look at the, the same curves, but for the one to three photon conversion. So we have a slightly different voltage bias so that we achieve a different process. And this time we don't have uh, a mean um, um, reflection probability that goes to zero. It goes quite low for this, uh, for, for a certain value of EG, but it doesn't go to zero. This time the value for the Jodelson energy has to be higher because we are going to higher uh, number of, of photons being created as we discussed in uh, some previous talks. And um, we still have a conversion efficiency that is close to 75%, that's actually exactly 75%. And uh, this time the dark rate in gray is way higher because we increase the Jodelson energy so the, the system can couple to more spurious modes inside the environment, especially low frequency uh, modes and that generates a lot of uh, unwanted photons because of that. And this time it's around 400 megahertz, which is pretty high for this kind of device. Again, if we look at the, um, the same curves as function of frequency, we have again the same bandwidth and we have uh, this maximum uh, probability of 75%. Now we can look at what happens when we increase the the input power, so the number of photons we send to the, uh, to the device. And of course, after a certain number of uh, photons at the input, we will start to have a degradation of the, the performance of our device. And this is what we see here. And uh, what is summarized in the inset where the, uh, we plotted the conversion probability at 4.74 gigahertz. That corresponds to the maximum of the, re of the resonator. And we see that above minus 120 dBm, we start to have a quick uh, degradation of this conversion efficiency, meaning we have a saturation power of our, uh, uh, around that point. This uh, corresponds to around six photons in average in the input resonator, which is not that high, but for a photo multiplier that is aimed at very low power, because you, you want basically to multiply a few number of photons, otherwise you would use a, a an amplifier for that, it's, it's not such a, such a problem. And actually, one of the, um, of the usage we, uh, we try to realize for the, using those devices is uh, in the case of single photon detection. Basically, if we take uh, two of those devices and put them one after the other using a single mode uh, as, a, as the output mode for the first stage and the input mode for the second stage, we can have what we call a cascaded photomultiplier. Basically one photon would be, uh, in the case of one to three conversion, would be converted to three photons. That would be then converted to nine photons. And as soon as one of those photons is emitted inside the transmission line for further measurement and detection, the reverse process cannot be achieved. That means we can find, uh, as before, a value of EG that will enable, theoretically, a perfect impedance matching and a perfect conversion from the one photon to the nine photon. 
one, uh, the, the two advantages of this system compared to other photo uh, detectors uh, using qubits, for example, is that this system is number resolving. We can send uh, several photons at the input and we'll get uh, the same number multiplied by nine at the output, as long as we stay below this uh, saturation threshold I've talked about before. And uh, for this kind of devices, we don't have any dead time. So uh, with that, I will uh, conclude with one last information, one last uh, advantage of such system is that the, the physics of these processes is valid up to, uh, to the frequency corresponding to the gap of the superconductor. For aluminum, that means frequency up to the uh, around 100 gigahertz, but if we switch to large gap superconductors such as niobium, uh, we can hope to uh, use frequency that we go in the terahertz regime. And that is basically what we're going to try to do in, uh, in the following years. Uh, lastly, I'll mention that while we understand quite well what is happening, we don't really have uh, a good understanding of some strange processes. And especially, we uh, observe some uh, nonlinear amplification where several input photons will be involved in this uh, in the parametric amplification. Uh, we don't really understand those processes. And uh, our, our description is based on the POV theory and uh, input output description. So uh, we would like to get further than that if we want to, uh, to have a very open system with large less energy. With that, uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them as best as I can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola, for the nice presentation. I have a question which is maybe trivial, but what actually limits your conversion rate? Because you, I mean, the optimal point somehow is the point where uh, there is no reflection, so all the incoming signal is sucked by the system, but it's apparently not converted to 100%. To so what, what, is, what limits the, um, the conversion? The first... One of the first trivial answers would be uh, spurious uh, processes. We have, um, uh, for example, we have direct transmission through the capacitor for the junction. That is something we are going to try to eliminate by reducing the size of the junction. Um, we add, at one point, some noise in the system. So that would also reduce the, the, the efficiency because you would uh, kind of uh, see uh, an average uh, around the, 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 the peak of uh, maximum conversion, so you could reduce your, your conversion efficiency. Uh, we reduce that noise quite well, but we still have uh, voltage noise on, uh, on the voltage bias, of course. And, um, and you, you can see here the, the total probability is quite well below one, so we still have photons going somewhere else, yeah. maybe in other, uh, at other frequencies for with other processes or spurious modes inside the environment where we, that we still do not control perfectly, things like that. Thank you. So in the first part, uh, uh, regarding the comparison with the POV theory, uh, yeah. I'm surprised that, well, I would expect the opposite, that uh, essentially the width, with, you see the width is not matching uh, well. Mm -hmm. Whereas the height is, seems to be better, uh, I would expect the opposite, right? Because the, the, the width, normally you know it better, and then the height is related to the coupling, so I would expect the, the, the opposite would happen. So why is it a little wider? I mean, the POV theory, uh, let's say, prediction? Uh, I'm afraid I will not be able to answer this question. I did not do the, um, the, the calculation myself. All I know is they use the POV theory to calculate the admittance of the junction and the get that inside the, the linear circuits to calculate those, uh, those gains. Uh, we are not that far, I would say, from the applicability of the POE theory. The reduction energy is not that, I mean, it's higher than what it should be for the POE theory, but it's not that high. Uh, we have other problems appearing at higher reduction energy, as we saw in different talks. There is some bifurcation uh, problems and all that, and uh, we see we cannot use those in the, the, all devices in this high stress energy regime. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hi. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, just an experimental curiosity. How do you measure the DAC rates more specifically? Uh, we just use these, the 
we measure the power spectral density. Basically, here it's uh, on the bound width of 400 megahertz. We integrate the, uh, all the energy, basically, and um, to count the number of photons without any signal at the input. Okay, oh, it's just a spectrum analyzer measurement, but then, then you have 400 megahertz bandwidth and, and 10 megahertz dark rate, right? Uh, you said, so you, you're like measuring uh, a fraction of a fraction of a photon as PSD? Sorry, I didn't really understand that. Because uh, at one point, you, whenever you measure your power, you need to know to divide. I mean, to divide if, you, 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 if you divide by the bandwidth, you, you get an energy. And if I, so it gives yeah. you a very, very small energy. Yeah. And you can still resolve that in your measurement. I mean, accurately. Uh, I would say yes. I, I, again, I, mean, I didn't do the experiment, but I would say yes. The uh, the, the measurement, the averages is uh, on a quite long, long time, time oh, okay. with on-off measurements, yes. and uh, all the, the calibration is quite well done for all those. Okay. Thanks. Measurements. All right. Since there don't seem to be more questions, let's thank Nicola again. <laughs> we'll have a coffee break.